Hey everybody, welcome to my tutorial video for swords and bagpipes. Now before we go anywhere, I need to let you know this is a promotional preview copy of the game, which means all the components I have here are not going to be the final release components, just to give you a really good example. The unit tokens, this is what my promotional copy looks like right here, but the final release is going to show that the units are going to look like these tokens right here. And finally, the money is going to look a little bit better in the final release. This is what the final release money should look like. This is what the money looks like right now, plus the components for the card stock. The board and everything is definitely going to be improving for the retail release of the game. But the castles, the camps, and the general artwork work for the board and everything else should stay pretty much the same. So anyways, to play Swords and Bagpipes, the first thing we need to do is we need to set up the board. And that's going to require you to do is to shuffle up all the bagpipe cards, place them on the board right where they go. Take all the betrayal cards, shuffle them up, and place them on the board. Then you're going to have to grab the gray invasion cards and the red invasion cards. And the game is played over seven rounds, so what we need to do is we need to get the red cards right here. Take one of the cards at random. Don't look at which one you're taking. The other one's going to be removed from the game and not used at all. And you'll place it down on the board right here. Then you're going to grab six cards at random. The other cards are removed from the game. They're not going to be used at all. And they're going to be placed on top of the board. And that's going to give you your total seven rounds that you're going to play the game through. Then every single player needs to make sure that they pick a castle a fort and their matching loyalty tokens that's going to show the crown and the Scottish hat on the top which you're going to use to decide which kind of loyalty you're going to be having on every single round. Every player is going to make sure they get three gold. Every player starts with three armies on their castle and then every single player gets to start with one bagpipe card. The game is set up. You're now ready to play. Swords and Bagpipes is played over seven rounds, and each round is broken up into seven very distinct phases. The very first phase of the game is called the Invasion Phase. Now, during the Invasion Phase, what you need to do is you need to flip over the very top card of the Invasion deck, and that's going to tell you exactly what the clans are going to have to deal with on this current round. This card is going to do a couple different things. The first thing it's going to do is it's going to tell you exactly what's going to happen to all the clans who support Scotland this round, and what kind of rewards they're going to get. For example, on this card, it's going to show that if you do support Scotland, and Scotland does win the war this round, you're going to make three gold for your clan, and you're also going to get to draw a bagpipe card. If you decide to support Scotland, but Scotland is defeated by England this round, your clan is only going to get one gold, and you're going to get one army back in compensation for the loss at the hands of the English people. And then finally, you're going to see that every single player who decided to support England this turn has to split up this amount of money among all the people who decided to support England. So you kind of have a guessing game. You're trying to read the other players constantly and trying to decide exactly what the other players are going to do. Because if you're the only person who supports England on this round, for example, you'd make eight gold this round. But if you're one of four people who decide to support England this round, you're only going to make two gold. And even though Scotland may have fallen this round, you're only going to make one gold more than the people who support Scotland, even though Scotland fell. Because you all had to split eight gold among you while the loser is only going to make one gold and they don't have to worry about taking any trader cards. So again, this is a game of learning to judge the other players, trying to watch exactly what they're trying to do and trying to best judge what they're doing to become most efficiently and make the most money for your clan. A lot of these cards are also going to have special abilities. They're also going to matter. Every one of these cards is going to have a different special ability. You can read them all. There's eight different ones. Plus the two red cards are all going to have a little bit different abilities. And finally, at the bottom of the invasion card is going to tell you exactly what size army is invading Scotland this turn. In this example, you can see that the invasion is going to have a strength of five. That means Scotland must rally at least five armies because Defender does win ties. But Scotland must rally at least five armies this turn to stave off England from invading them this round. After you've done the invasion phase, you're going to move on to the actions phase where every single player in player order and the first player always gets the badge of honor. The game tells you to pick the oldest player to become the first player, but I don't like that rule, so what we usually do is just figure out some better way to figure out who the first player is. But the first player needs to make a couple decisions on their turn. They can pick one of three different actions that they can do in any order. The first thing they can do is they can do a replenishment, which is give them one of four different things they can do for replenishment. You pick one of these four things, and the replenishment action is mandatory. You do have to do it. The first thing you do for your replenishment is you can decide to take one gold for your clan, that's your only one action you do for your replenishment, or what you can do is you can decide that you're going to take one army for your fort, one army for every other player's fort, 
And this is also going to put one army in defense of Scotland to help out Scotland this round. The next replenishment action you can do is you can decide just to take two armies for your castle. And then finally what you can do if you like is you can spend one gold to go ahead and raise two armies in your castle. After you decide on your one singular replenishment action, the final thing you can do on your action turn is you can move as many armies as you want from your castle to your camp. Now all your armies in your camp are the ones that are going to go to war against England. Once you've made this decision, you've decided to end this turn. Unless you play cards, there's no way you can change this decision. So you must decide how many armies you want to send to your camp to protect Scotland, or if you're going to be a traitor, how many armies you're going to send to your camp to help England. But we'll get into that in just one moment. This is also the only time that you can play any bagpipe cards that happen out of this axe symbol on them. You can play them at any time during your turn before you decide to end your turn, but you can only play these bagpipe cards that have the axe symbol on them. You don't have to do them. They're optional, but if you do decide to play them, they all have their various abilities on them, and some of them also have a times 2 multiplier on them. If you ever play a bagpipe card that has a times 2 multiplier over here in the lower right-hand corner, that does mean that after you play it, you're not going to discard it. You're going to lay it down in front of you, and that does mean you can use that card one more time during the game, and after you use the card the second time, then it's put in the discard pile and removed from the game. After every single player has had a chance to take an action phase, in player order, you're going to go around the table. Every player is going to do their complete action phase. They're going to be finished in the next player, and the next player, next player, next player is going to do an action phase in player order until every player has had a chance to do an action phase. After you're done with that, you're going to move on to the badge of honor phase, where the current player who has the badge of honor and is currently player number one is going to pick another player that they're going to hand the badge of honor to. Whoever they hand the badge of honor to is going to be player number one in the next round, but not only that, the player they hand the badge to has no choice. They have to support Scotland this turn. They can't betray their country because that would be a very dishonorable thing to do. After the badge of honor plays phase, you're going to move on to the choice phase where every single player is going to secretly take one of their loyalty tokens and they're going to place it down on their camp. And after every single player has decided to place their loyalty token on their camp, deciding exactly which they're going to support, Scotland or England, before all players decide to reveal, every player now gets the chance to play any bagpipe cards that have the loyalty token down in the lower left-hand corner. So you, after every player has placed their tokens, but before they've been revealed, you can place as many of these cards as you want, as your hand in your hand. And again, if any of them have that times two multiplier, that does mean that you can play the card down once. And then it's going to be played down in front of you, and then sometime during the game, you can play the game again. And it's at that point that the card will actually be discarded and removed from the game. After all the players have had a chance to play their loyalty cards or loyalty bagpipe cards that they want to play, at that point, every single player is going to go ahead and reveal their loyalty, and you're going to see whether they're supporting England or if they're deciding to support Scotland with their armies this turn. And now we move on to the battle resolution phase. Every single player is going to add up all their armies based on whether they're supporting Scotland or whether they're deciding to support England, and we're going to find out exactly who decided or who's actually going to win the war on this round. So to do this, we need to add up all the armies for all the players who defended Scotland. So this player put two armies towards the war. This player put two armies towards the war, and this player had no choice since he had the badge of honor. He had to support Scotland, so he's also placing two armies towards the war. Scotland also already had one army defending itself, one of the neutral armies, so we're going to add this up. We're going to get a total of seven total armies protecting Scotland this turn. Well, Scotland is being invaded by five English armies, plus two traitorous dogs, and five more traitorous dogs who are betraying their country because they want to get the money. So we're going to add up five plus the two, plus the five is a total of 12. Well, 12 is greater than the seven that's defending Scotland, so England has won the war this round. If England wins the war, we're going to move the Scotland defeat marker up one point, and this marker ever gets to the skull marker, that means the game is over and Scotland has been completely defeated. And it doesn't matter how many rounds are left over, the game is still going to be over and we're going to use the alternate scoring rules. But since that's not the point yet, Scotland is going to suffer one defeat. And then all the players need to figure out exactly what kind of rewards they're going to get depending on if Scotland was successfully defended, whether Scotland fell, and whether they supported England or did not support England. 
And this moves us to the awards phase. Now we need to figure out exactly which clan is getting what and how much of what they're getting. So the first thing we need to do is since we found out that this turn that England has won the war, that means nobody's going to get the reward for what would have happened if Scotland would have won. And if you ever forget, this little marker right here will tell you exactly what these different things are. The nice healthy hat shows you the rewards for if Scotland won. The injured hat with the sword and the arrow in it lets you know what happens if Scotland fell. And this reward underneath the crown lets you know what happens to England supporters. And it doesn't matter if England fell or Scotland fell or Scotland was successful. It doesn't matter. That's still the reward you're going to get for supporting England. So in this example, we know that Scotland fell in this round. So all the players who supported Scotland, which would be these two clans, plus this clan right here is going to get a reward of one gold apiece for every one of these clans for supporting Scotland. They're going to get that reward. And then every single one of these clans who supported Skyland is also going to get one army. That's going to go directly into their castle. Remember, it doesn't go into the camp. It goes directly to their castle. Then all the players who supported England are going to divide up the total amount of gold they got for supporting England. Again, it doesn't matter if Scotland won or lost. They're still going to split this amount of money up. So every one of these players is going to get four gold, hand out fives each one of these guys, and take a, one back from each of them because they have to split the total reward, plus there may be any other bonuses or penalties on the text of all these cards. And every one of these cards has different bonus and penalty rewards and text on them. This is also the time where any player who has any bagpipe cards that can be played during the award phase can play. And these are just like the other cards. If they have the times two multiplier on them, that means you're simply going to play it, get the effect of it, and you're going to place it down in front of you, and then sometime during the game you can play the card again and then it's going to be removed from the game. And if it doesn't have that multiplier, you're simply going to play it for its effect and discard it and then remove it from the game. After all the players have gotten all the rewards, all the armies that are in all the camps and all the armies in the camps, and this also does mean the army that was neutral supporting Scotland over here, they're all going to be removed from all the players' boards. You're going to end this turn and you're going to go on to another round and we're going to do this process all over again by simply revealing another invasion card, going through all seven phases of the game, and we're going to keep doing that for a total of seven rounds, assuming that the invasion marker for England never completely destroys Scotland. There's only one more thing to explain to you, and that's the dagger betrayal cards. Every single time a player decides to betray their Scottish country and decides to get the gold from England, you're going to notice there's a little card symbol on here. And that does mean that every single time you decide to betray your company, you're going to have to take one of these betrayal cards face down and add that onto your board. Now you have to be very, very careful with these betrayal cards because they're numbered anywhere from one to two all the way up to three. And at the end of the game, all players need to add up all their dagger cards that they have in their complete castle at the end of the game. If you ever have five or more total betrayer higher than any other clan in the game, it doesn't matter how much money you have in your castle, you cannot win the game. So you need to be careful about not over betraying your country because if you get too many of these betrayal cards and your next person over is making sure that they're not betraying their country too much, you're going to lose the game no matter how rich you got. Players are going are to play this game through seven rounds and if they make it through seven rounds without their country being completely destroyed, the richest player is going to be the winner as long as they don't have too many of these dagger cards. And if Scotland does fall, the winner of the game is going to be the player who has the least amount of betrayal cards. Those are the basic rules for swords and bagpipes. There's a couple different advanced rules you can use for the game. You can mix them in how you like. Personally, there's one advanced rule that I always play with, and that's a second advanced rule I'll show you, but I'll show you the other two advanced rules really, really quick. The first advanced rule is that at the start of the game, each player starts with three bagpipe cards instead of one bagpipe card. Now this can make the game quite a bit more chaotic because these cards can be kind of powerful and it's quite possible for you to get a lucky draw of three cards at the start of the game, which can create a lot of havoc for the other players and kind of give you an unfair advantage. So that's kind of more of the beer and pretzels rule that you like to throw out there when everybody's had a couple of drinks and you really don't care and you really want to screw over your neighbors and just make everybody's life as difficult as possible. The other rule that you can have for the game is that you can semi make the deck of the dagger cards not totally random so you kind of have a more controlled amount of daggers so you can kind of judge how badly you're betraying your country
by adjusting the dagger deck and exactly how many dagger cards are going to be set up. It does make it a little more strategic that way. So, for example, if you happen to draw the one card, you know that one of the next four cards is going to be a couple threes and a couple twos. So the chances of you getting another one are very, very slim. So you want to judge exactly how often you're to be trained your country. And now that's an optional rule that I really like to play with, and it's how I always play the game now because I like just how it changes things up. But again, those are both optional rules you can throw in there to change up the gameplay for Swords and Bagpipes. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial video for the game. Stay tuned for my full review of the game. Now, I'm not going to do my normal playthrough for the game, and the simple reason for that is because this is a betrayal game, and I really can't betray myself unless I decide to conk myself over the head so I forget my moves every single turn. Not willing to do that, so we're going to have to skip the playthrough, move right to my review. Thanks for watching.